thank you. And thanks very much for inviting me. And good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be here in Dublin. First time I've ever been here. Um, OK, yeah. So basically, I'm going to talk about the relationship between governments, citizens, and digital technologies. Talk a bit about how I think that the behavior of governments and the behavior of citizens is changing, um, and how um, social media and big data might help us understand that and kind of make a better, make better um, governments, better policy making um, in the future. So I'm a professor at the University of Oxford. I'm the director of something called the Oxford Internet Institute, which I will quickly um, say what it is, in case you don't know. Um, we're a department of the University of Oxford. We're a very unusual department. We're new in Oxford terms, only um, 11 years old. Um, we're small. We're not the smallest department anymore. We're growing pretty rapidly. Um, but we're interesting because we're multidisciplinary. Um, so I'm a political scientist, um, but I work with computer scientists, even a physicist, um, sociologists, economists, um, geographers, um, anthropologists, informatics. I could go on and on. We have a really, really rich disciplinary um, mix. Um, we have a master's program called the Social Science of the Internet. Um, and a PhD program. And we have a totally um, multi-method approach. So we've got ethnographers, um, we've got, uh, we run the Oxford Internet Survey, but we also do a lot of work with big data generated from the internet um, and social media. And I want to say something about that. So basically, this is the kind of claim that I'm working from. Um, widespread use of digital technologies, particularly the internet and social media, are changing politics in very interesting ways. They're changing ways, uh, they're changing politics in ways that I think actually in, in many ways makes it more confusing. It's perhaps more difficult to understand government, more difficult to understand citizens and individual political behavior in the digital age. At the same time, as we go about our lives and as governments go about um, governmental affairs, everything, we, everything um, we do increasingly leaves digital traces. Those digital traces can be harvested to generate so-called big data, um, and that can aid our understanding of contemporary politics and possibly, as I said at the beginning, help to make government um, better. And I think that's a very interesting Development. What do I mean by digital trace? Well, there's a digital trace. Somebody um, went on a government site, um, and there's a screenshot from Google Analytics. Um, 737 visitors on the site. That went up by one when that person visit, visited the site. Um, and everything you do, any interaction with government, is going to generate something like that. But it's not just government or business or university sites that generate digital traces. It's also the case that um, social media, social media of every kind, um, also generates digital traces. People um, across the developed world, but also the developing world, um, spend growing um, proportions of their time on social media um, and other internet-based platforms. Um, all the ones there, and many, many more, when people go there, as they increasingly do, to shop, work, entertain themselves, educate themselves, date, socialize, um, bank, you, you, you name it, there's a chance that people are doing it, um, uh, 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 are doing it online. They are leaving digital traces, and that is also generating um, large-scale um, large data. Just quickly, um, I, I'm sure in Ireland, as we do in the UK, you've been talking about big data um, for a while. It's the hottest new trend. It's not new anymore, but it's the hottest trend in the corporate world. Government has perhaps been rather slower um, to um, discuss the um, kind of positives and negatives of, of big data and what might be done with it. But what do I mean by big data? I need to define the term because uh, there are many definitions. Basically, um, I think what's interesting a bit about big data is that the kind of data that you might generate from social media or from um, government information systems or that businesses are generating is it's real-time transactional data about what people really did, not data um, about what people think they did or think they might do or think they like 
which is what survey data is. As a social scientist, I find that a very exciting development because this is a new kind of way to understand the world. The survey has been the traditional staple of social science, and now we're getting all sorts of examples of new sorts of data, and I want to show you some examples. Um, what is big? How big is big data? I don't actually think uh, the traditional definition of big data is that it's outside the capability of a normal desktop computing environment, or as one um, official at a uh, workshop we held in Boston last year on big data said, you basically mean data we can't handle. Um, and she had a point. Um, but it doesn't have to be that big um, as, as long as data gives us some sort of um, real-time transactional view on a big uh, on on some kind of whole population um, that could be um, not so very big as some of the data that I'll show you will come into that category. I think this kind of data has big potential for understanding both institutions and individual behaviour. So, what about governments? How might we use big data to understand government? Governments, after all, um, for the last 50, 60 years, governments in industrialised nations have been heavily reliant on huge-scale information systems. With widespread use of the internet, with the development of electronic interfaces, um, then in some ways the electronic bit of government is the bit that most people interact with in most of their interactions with government. For many people, it's the only bit of government they really see. Um, of, of executive government that they really see. So it's a very important window on government. Um, and in some ways, we, 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 we don't know that much about it. Um, but, uh, we, we see government websites, we hear about government websites and government transactions and government interactions. Um, but, but looking at it in the round is not actually something that we know very, uh, we, we do very often, e even um, academic researchers or, or indeed governments themselves. In fact, I showed um, somebody from, from the UK government um, one of the uh, uh, images I'm just about to show you, and uh, he pointed at it and said, I want that. Um, it's, his <laughs> it's his electronic interface, um, but you, you know, we don't take stock very often of what it looks like. This is actually some data from a, a very big data set, da big by any standards, I think. It's around um, 30 terabytes of compressed data. It's the entire .uk domain for the last 15 years. So it's every, um, every web page um, of the, in the .uk domain for the last 15 years, collected by the Internet Archive for the British Library. Um, we have a research project at the Oxford Internet Institute to try and sort of open up this data set and do interesting things with it, see what it can tell us about a country on the web um, over a sustained period of time. This shows the growth of domains. It shows that back in 97, you know, there was quite, quite rapid um, growth of these four um, overarching domains, .co, .org, .ac, .gov. Um, but it shows that although government and universities were, were reasonably quick to start growing, um, they've sort of plattered out in terms of the growth, as you might under... We don't expect government to uh, experience massive growth, but in that period, .co and .org um, domains have grown um, pretty, um, uh, have grown much more rapidly. This is a log, uh, a log scale on the side. <clears throat> if we look at um, sort of proportionally the relative sector size on the web, we see there um, perhaps. Uh, perhaps slightly uh, disappointing news for <laughs> universities and governments because um, the um, .ac and .gov sectors were really a big chunk of the UK um, web, and I'm, I'm sure this would be true um, in, in, in many other countries, um, back in 96, uh, 97, but now a tiny, tiny um, proportion of the overall um, size of the web. Still vitally important, of course, I'm sure we'd all agree, um, but, but a much uh, smaller percentage than they were. So this is one way of looking at government on the web. This is a, a, a crawl of the entire UK government that we carried out in 2010. Um, and 
This can tell us interesting things about a government, I think, things that would be quite difficult to do in the, in the offline world. We can see how visible government is. We can count the number of in-links there are coming into government, which is some kind of idea of how um, visible it is to people using Google, um, for example. We can look at how navigable it is from one bit of the government to the other. We can look at how, how you can go into government, the sort of immediacy, the depth of, 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 of links, how, how deep you can go in terms of information. We can measure all these things with what are called web metrics. And we can see the extent to which government looks outward, how, the extent to which it looks out into other sources and draws people into other information sources, or whether it's kind of introverted, just um, referring to itself. <coughs> You see an interesting characteristic of the UK government in an online context there. That big red bob is direct.gov.uk, uh, now been replaced by the uh, portal.gov.uk. But the point is, um, you're looking at quite a centralised government there, this uh, centralisation of content um, and a running down of departmental websites, which is a long-term trend um, in the UK uh, digital agenda. There, just as a comparison, this is a very rough, uh, we've only just done this map, so excuse its roughness, but what this basically shows is a sort of opposite kind of scenario where the ministries are the big blobs there and the little light green dot gov dot um, jp there um, in the middle is actually small in comparison with the ministry, so that's a very decentralised government. So interesting differences between governments that we can get at with this kind of big data. <clears throat> what about citizens then in, um, in, 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 in the digital world? Um, how is individual political behaviour changing um, and how can we understand it with this kind of data? Um, well, I have a certain sort of uh, argument about that. We've just had um, uh, lunch with, with some of you here and I think I, 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 I think... Um, I may uh, not be in total agreement with all the people who were there at lunch, or at least they may not be in total agreement with me. So I'd be interested to know what you think about this argument. Um, but this is, um, this is uh, uh, um, our, our, our perspective on the way that individual political behaviour is changing. And I'll just run through the argument and then give you some examples. So basically, as citizens go about their lives on social media, um, they come across political issues um, on, uh, uh, on a, 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 a regular basis in perhaps ways that they don't so much in the offline world. Um, and by that I mean that people can make micro donations of political resources, time, effort, money. And they can make these, uh, the, these um, micro donations have been possible, have become possible because the transaction costs have sunk so much. What do I mean by micro donation? It could be signing an electronic petition, joining an email, um, uh, joining an email campaign and banging out an email. It could be clicking like, um, sharing a, a, a video about a political issue, maybe downloading a video, sharing a news item, Tiny acts of political participation, very small acts, which previously just wouldn't have been possible. I'm sure in Ireland, as you can in the UK, you can watch the television and there'll be an advertisement saying, text the word blanket and thereby contribute three pounds to a campaign um, for Syrian refugees. It wouldn't have been possible to donate three pounds to a campaign like that before very easily because it would have cost too much money to give the three pounds to make it worthwhile. It's this lowering of transaction costs that is making very small acts of participation become possible. I know that, that this is an uncontroversial, this, that this is a slightly controversial thing to say. Um, I, I think um, I got a sense from that at lunch that in Ireland, just as in the UK, in the UK we very much have a culture of it's a sort of politics as pain principle. Politics is supposed to be painful. Um, and it's as if it's not painful, then it's not real politics. So if it's just little, it's no good. You've got to go to you know, a boring meeting or a long meeting in a cold place or something like that. As Oscar Wilde said, the problem with socialism is it cuts so dreadfully into the evenings. So if it hasn't cut into the evening, it's not, it's not proper politics. And I think that is quite a pervasive thing about many political, established political cultures. It's certainly true in the UK. Um, but my argument is that these very small-scale actions scale up to large-scale mobilisations. 
which are interesting sort of mobilizations. They are mobilizations which can get going without leaders in the traditional sense and without um, organizations in the traditional sense. They can form quickly, they can fail quickly, they're very unpredictable and chaotic. And that's leading to a new democratic model. We call it chaotic pluralism in the book that I've just written with my co-authors Peter John from UCL, um, Scott Hale and Taha Yusseri from the Oxford Internet Institute. Um, and, and, and that's what, what we mean by it. Micro donations of uh, micro participatory acts which scale up to large scale mobilizations of a certain kind. Now, we can use data, the kind of big data that I was talking about at the beginning, to understand um, these mobilizations and to kind of test some of my assertions just there. Uh, so here's people um, sharing uh, petitions on Twitter, for example. Um, so people are signing electronic petitions and they're sharing them on, on Twitter, trying to sort of draw people in to signing a petition. There's a... Uh, participatory acts in one place are spreading to acts in another place um, uh, in, in, in this kind of way. Um, now, once these do scale up, um, and we've seen that most famously in the Arab Spring, of course, um, I'm not ascribing the whole Arab Spring to social media, but I think it certainly is the case that in Egypt, for example, where this image comes from, um, websites like We Are All Khaled Said were crucial in kind of gathering um, enough likes and, uh, sorry, that's clicking over automatically, um, in, in, enough likes to kind of tip resistance against the regime over into critical mass. I think it is right to say that they played um, a crucial role there. As I said, these kind of, uh, these kind of mobilizations are, can get going without the normal organizational trappings of revolution or large-scale um, or, or, or large demonstration. When the Brazilian um, president, Dilma Rousseff, asked to talk to the leaders of this demonstration in Brazil, she was told, um, there are no leaders, you can't, you know, there are, there are no leaders here. And we're seeing this kind of, phenom this kind of phenomenon also in liberal democracies um, with the um, very small participatory acts that I mentioned. So here's, a, here's the UK petitions platform. Is there a petitions platform in Ireland? <laughs> you should get one, they're cool. <laughs> anyway, this is the uh, petitions platform of the UK government. Yeah, any citizen can um, put a petition on here and start to try and raise signatures for it. Now, this, this site, as you can see, the number of signatures are there. We, we, we scrape this site every hour to, to create a really, um, what I would call a big data set, which is all signatories on petitions. Um, it's all anonymized, they're not with people's names or anything, just numbers, um, over the last three years. We do that in the UK, the US, and we're starting to do it in other countries too. And that means that we can look at every single petition and the kind of rise um, in signatories for every petition and have a look at kind of all these growth curves to try and understand this sort of mobilization. Now, one really robust finding across countries is that most mobilizations fail. Most petitions fail completely. 95% of petitions fail to get even um, the, uh, the 500 signatures that you used to need for an official response. Um, in the UK, uh, on, on the UK platform. 99% uh, fail to get 10,000, which is what you need for an official response now. 99.9% um, fail to get the 100,000 you need for a parliamentary debate in the UK. Now, this is a significant, a significant numbers of people take on this act. Um, I'd say around 10% of, 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 of the population, at least, um, have, have been signing petitions, and, and, and that number is growing. Petitions have long been um, uh, one of the most popular participatory acts outside voting, but they are becoming more popular. The other thing we're finding is that petitions on the same issue um, can be incredibly successful or can bomb out completely. Um, we tracked um, three petitions um, uh, in, in the UK, if you want to look at any sort of political act, if you go, if you look sort of at a cute animal, then yeah. the chances are that you'll be able to find quite a lot of political activity going on. We look at we looked at three petitions on almost exactly the same issue with very similar wording to um, 
uh, kind of save, uh, to, to protest against the uh, culling of badgers, which is a recent policy development. Um, uh, we found petitions which completely failed to get even 500 signatures. We found some somewhere in the middle in that uh, sort of bright red block there on the graph. Um, and we found one that actually achieved in getting a parliamentary debate. Um, started at more or less similar times, same issue, radically different fates. The fact is, this is quite an unpredictable, these are unpredictable kind of mobilizations. Um, uh, uh, most fail. We don't know so much about why the ones succeed. We do know that the first day is absolutely crucial. We've modeled this data to show that um, really, if a petition hasn't made it in 10 hours, um, it's going to be uh, digital dust. But we can do, because um, each of the kind of acts that I'm talking about generates digital traces, generates, the, uh, generates big data, we can do all kinds of things to understand this kind of political mobilization. This is the ling linguistics patterns in um, a Twitter network generated um, by Scott Hale, um, who, who, who works with me at the Oxford Internet Institute. Um, we also might start to be able to model this in new sorts of ways. I mentioned at the beginning that we're a multidisciplinary institute. And indeed, um, one of the, uh, Scott Hale is a computer scientist working with me, a political scientist. Um, we also, um, uh, the other member of our research, my immediate research team is a, is a physicist. Um, and these kind of data, um, these kind of mobilizations are exhibiting many of the characteristics of what we call, what scientists call a chaotic system, the weather being a classic example. And some people have argued, I mean, the fact that um, basically meteorologists have got better at predicting the weather. Um, the fact that that's Oxford. Um, well, I, I would say it was Oxford a month ago, but it was Oxford a couple of weeks ago as well, or Oxford six weeks ago. It's pretty much Oxford looks like that quite a bit these days. Um, but um, the fact is that um, ability to uh, uh, predict what the weather that led to those floods and made Oxford look like that was very helpful in, um, in, in, in being able to uh, put up the flood defences and to mitigate the effects of, of this dramatic weather. And I think we might be able to see the same sort of possibilities for political activity. Um, here is um, a model um, developed by two researchers at OII, one of which is Taha Yasseri, the physicist, using Wikipedia page views to predict the Iranian election result, the most recent Iranian election result, more successfully than traditional methods of, of predicting. Um, and I think that's quite, um, uh, that, 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 that's a very interesting possibility. Um, the kind of political superstar of big data, Nate Silver, who I'm sure many of you have heard of, um, uh, who's uh, just written a book called The Art and Science of Prediction, has argued that just as meteorologists have got better at predicting the weather, um, we ought to be able to get better at predicting electoral politics using things um, like Wikipedia page views would be one possibility for doing that, um, as, as, as we have done. But it also might be possible to do all sorts of other things. I mean, as a political scientist, um, when it came to the financial crisis, I used to enjoy saying to people I knew who were economists, you know, we well, didn't see that coming, uh, did you? Um, but of course, when it came to the Arab Spring, as a political scientist, um, it wasn't such a good uh, joke for me, I mean, um, because of course we didn't see it coming, and very, very few people saw it coming, even after um, the Tunisian Revolution. Um, so... There might be a possibility here to think about new ways of predicting political activity, but more than that, of understanding the sort of data that I'm talking about, the, the big data generated by digital governments and digital citizens, um, to make government better. And what, 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 what do I mean by that? Well, for example, there's a lot of free information out there on social media about what people think about government, what they think about new policies, what they think about services, how they experience it somewhere. And there's a lot of willingness among citizens to actually express their opinions about that. Um, how many, you know, what percentage of the Irish population use TripAdvisor, for example, or other feedback systems when they're dealing with the private sector? Why wouldn't they do that about government? And some people on discussion forums like Mumsnet, that's the 
a big one in the UK, but there are many, many others, are, are, are participating in discussions, they're talking about government, they're giving their opinions for free, giving information for free, and that, that could be used um, to generate data. We've just done a little piece of work with the Department of Work and Pensions in the UK to work out the feasibility of generating data about sort of what people are thinking and worrying about when it comes to um, universal credit and benefits changes um, and how we might use social media data to sort of um, inform us about that. Um, of course, there's challenges to doing that. Um, I, I mentioned multidisciplinarity a couple of times. I never thought, as a political scientist, that I would be working with a physicist and a computer scientist. And that can be really hard. I can find myself looking at an email from one of... Um, uh, somebody else in my research team are thinking, oh gosh, do I understand it? Maybe I do, maybe I don't. Um, and, and actually, I have a mathematical background, and that's a big challenge for government. You know, we really are talking about using um, multiple methods and multiple disciplinary perspectives to kind of do this kind of um, analysis, this kind of policy analysis. But I think it could be really worth it. Um, I mean, the revelations of the, the, the Snowden revelations of the summer and the new insights we got into what intelligence agencies, um, principally the US and the UK, um, were doing with data gave um, a big knock to the reputation of big data um, when it's got anything to do with government. Um, and I think, in some ways, I think governments have almost got a sort of responsibility to, to try and look for ways of using data for good rather than just monitoring for bad. Um, uh, during the whole um, uh, discussion of, of what the intelligence agencies were doing um, with big data last summer, there were, uh, policymakers were rushing to say, oh, it's too, big to, it's too big to use, it's too big to understand, we throw most of it away, we don't use it. But there might be an argument for actually using that kind of data, for gathering that kind of data and using that data to make government better, to make it more in line um, with citizens' needs um, and preferences. Of course, there are major ethical challenges here. Um, um, this kind of data has to be, um, it has to be um, anonymised. Um, we have to develop a whole new ethical framework for using this kind of data. Many social media platforms that I've mentioned have very... Um, stringent regulations on what sort of data you may draw down for them and which you, which you may not, and, and for very good reasons. And we have to be sort of wise to the, um, uh, wise to the uh, uh, kind of intellectual challenge that that presents as well. We don't just want... It's actually easier to draw down data from Twitter than it is from anything else, so we don't just want to look at the world according to Twitter. Um, but I think if you can, if we can sort of um, face those challenges and, and um, develop um, the right kind of ethical um, frameworks for dealing with this kind of data, there is um, a real um, possibility for enabling um, government to be more agile and responsive. I think the internet, internet platforms and social media really are part of um, the democratic weather now, and governments have got to... It's not going to go away... Um, and governments um, face the challenge that they've got to sort of get used to this new environment. Now, I don't think it's going to be possible to completely, you, you know, satisfy the demands of these um, snowmen against uh, global warming, for example, but it may be possible to kind of understand a bit better um, what, their, what their concerns are um, and to allay their fears and to be more accountable to them. Thank you.